Let me introduce our first speaker, Don Bernwick. Don started his career as a pediatrician and is now recognized as a leading authority on healthcare quality and improvement. And his expertise is sought internationally. Don is a former administrator of CMS who currently serves as President Emeritus and Senior Fellow of the Institute for Healthcare Improvements, which he co-founded. He has published over 129 articles in professional journals and has received numerous awards for his many, many contributions to improving healthcare systems. Don is an inspiring thought leader and is a valued advisor to Nickham, and we're delighted to welcome him here today. Thank you, uh, Nancy, and thank you all for the chance to share some thoughts with you in this really important meeting. Um, uh, my, my, I think my job, my assignment from Nancy is kind of to set the stage for you. I'm going to give you some background here. My talk is going to be mo mostly about the magnitude of the challenge we have with social determinants and a definition. I'm going to reference some science, so I'm trying to give you a science-based framework for thinking about what social determinants are, uh, which might be an initial portal to wise public policy. And then I'll close with a few ho hopeful examples, places where the healthcare systems are getting involved in, in solving this, and you'll hear from my co-panelists some really wonderful examples of that. A lot of what I'm building on comes from scholarship in the field of um, social determinants. Uh, much of this particular talk rests on the work of Sir Michael Marmot uh, from England. Michael is one of the leading epidemiologists in the world concerned with this problem. And if you have not read his book, The Health Gap, I suggest you read it. And if you read it, you don't have to hear the rest of this talk, because a lot of what I'm doing, I'm stealing uh, from Michael. The problem in the US context is, is pretty serious. As you, you probably know, the United States does not rank well in health and well-being. Uh, measures like infant mortality and longevity, a very important Institute of Medicine study called Shorter Lives, Poorer Health showed that the United States ranked, in fact, the bottom of the 17 wealthy countries that we were then compared with in terms of life expectancy. This is the 2007 figure. We're right at the bottom in life expectancy of the 17 OECD countries uh, cited in that report. It's gotten worse. Uh, we are now 26th in the list of OECD countries. Since more countries have been added, we've just slipped down the ranks. On the worldwide stage, our life expectancy is 43rd in the world for a country spending more than twice as much as any other country in the world, most other countries in the world, on our health care. A vivid uh, way to think about this that I, I want to acquaint you with uh, is known in the epidemiologic world as subway maps or bus maps. And I'll show you, I'll show you what it looks like and give you some statistics. Uh, this is London, a map of London. And if you compare here uh, life expectancy in a wealthy area of London, this is around Oxford Circus, to a much less wealthy area of London over in East London um, at um, um, uh, probably about three miles away, two and a half miles away, away, you're looking at a difference of life expectancy over about two and a half uh, miles of, um, of about 21 years. Uh, in other words, uh, th there's 2.6 years of life lost in expectancy over, uh, for, for uh, every mile traveled. Uh, you can find maps like this all over the world and in the U.S. Here's the map for New York City, for example, looking at 85th Street in Manhattan. Uh, where the people walking above you are largely white, their, large, their income on average is well over $130,000, uh, and they're employed compared to the South Bronx, where a lot of th these are communities of color, much, incomes are much lower. Uh, the loss of life in, in um, this uh, two-mile two journey is about 2.3 years per mile in, in New York. That's a life expectancy change of 10 years. Uh, you can find the same statistics in Chicago from uh, the Loop to uh, West to uh, Westlake, Chicago is a 16-year life expectancy difference from the high to low income areas of Flint, Michigan. It's a 15-year life expectancy difference. Um, these are relatively large numbers, and I want to explain to you how large they are. I, I need to modify your understanding of this. This is not like a uh, this is not like a gradual decline. This is a cliff. Uh, the life expectancy changes occur relatively suddenly when you enter areas that, of deprivation, uh, poverty, and other kinds of social challenges. Um, how big is the difference? Uh, six months for every minute on the subway in New York, 3.2 years for every mile traveled. But let's get a sense of how big that is. And the way I want to show you is with respect to a pretty important breakthrough in treatment in prevention of coronary disease in the United States is, as many of you know, one of the most commonly taken drugs in, in our country right now are statins. Statins lower your cholesterol rate, and they appear, although the literature is controversial, they do appear to have some effect on the chances you'll have a heart attack 
especially if your cholesterol was elevated. Uh, this is a study from the British Medical Journal which assembled uh, all the relevant data as of 2015 to estimate the effects of statins. And to summarize everything, if you take the most favorable results in research on statins, approximately for every year you're on a statin, you gain one day of life. If you're on 20 years of statin treatment, you'll gain about 20 days of life on average. Uh, 20 days of life is the effect of taking statins for 20 years. 20 days of life is what's lost on the D train in Manhattan in seven seconds traveling to the South Bronx. In uh, Glasgow, Scotland, you lose seven days of life on a bus trip in the first 43 feet of that trip. In other words, whatever is creating these cliffs, whatever is producing this discrepancy, a place-based discrepancy in uh, health and well-being uh, is massive. It is a, it's an 800-pound gorilla compared to the relatively puny things we can do with life expectancy and longevity with medical care. Uh, not to say medical care is unimportant. No part of my believes in a minute that we should deny people access to high-tech care. If you need coronary surgery, you should get it. If you need chemotherapy, you get it. If you need statins, you should take them. But it would be a complete illusion to imagine that relying on even universal access, which we don't even have in this country in healthcare, would be anything more than pushing on a string with respect to the overall life status, uh, life expectancy and health status of the population. So the, the term used to describe what this other stuff is that creates these cliffs is social determinants of health. It's a widely used term. I would say SURF is up on this term. Uh, I've worked in healthcare many years. I've known about this for decades. But well, recently, uh, you can hear this term over and over again in the public discourse. And thank, thank goodness, you hear it at a bipartisan level in Congress. And it is worth tackling, to say the least. But what does it mean? Uh, uh, I'm going to draw heavily, as I said, on Michael Marmot's work. Michael uh, produced in his book, The Health Gap, a way to understand this. And he, he, he outlines six components of social, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, social determinants of health, conditions of daily life that matter, he, he, he's called them. And I want to just walk you through the six. I personally believe it's possible to create a policy framework around these six. No one of them would solve it. You have to have a portfolio view in which we tackle on a science-based social determinants uh, across a quite a wide range of determinants. Uh, the first is, so, is the experiences of early childhood. There are many ways to understand this. But what happens to kids around birthing and in the first several years of their life determines their life expectancy as adults uh, strongly. Uh, one of the most dramatic findings here has to do with so-called ACEs, or adverse childhood experiences, first developed by a research team at Kaiser Permanente in, in, com, in consort with um, colleagues at, at the CDC. This is a relatively simple idea. If you ask, essentially, a kid, uh, two, three, four years old about exposure to adverse experiences, which is a list of stresses, 10 stresses in the normal form. And you simply tick the box if they say yes to a stress like you don't have enough to eat or you've witnessed violence in your family. Uh, the number of yeses correlates dramatically with health status in the long run. Uh, people who give four or more yeses as children to the ACE score have double the rate of lung cancer, double the, more than that rate of heart disease. They're, uh, they're 11 times higher, I believe, more at, more at risk for suicide. They are 14 times more at risk, I believe, for substance abuse as adults. Early childhood experiences are determinants of health status as adults. In the United States, by the way, we don't rank very well. And trying to affect the experience of children and youth, uh, we score very poorly. We're ranked last among 20 nations in this UNICEF ranking of child well-being. And investments in children are, we rank very poorly. Most countries have redistributional approaches to see that children in poverty and deprivation have supports. We rank very low in the country, uh, the second worst child poverty rate of 35 nations, 35 wealthy nations. We have not invested in changing the well-being of children in this country as a matter of pu public policy. The second is, the, is how people are educated. Education bears a very strong relationship with health and life expectancy. There's a, this is a chart just showing educational achievement versus life expectancy for white and black men. It affects both races. We're looking at a decade that is a New York subway trip experience difference in life expectancy depending on educational achievement. Scientists would ask about the causal relationship. Is it that poor health causes poor educational attainment or a poor educational attainment causes poor health? I'll tell you scientifically the direction is worse educational attainment produces uh, uh, ill health. There are countries that have erased this relationship, again, by focusing on equity and educational achievement and, and, 
and uh, support. Uh, you actually can erase these differences so that even people who don't achieve highest levels of education still have the same health expectancy as people who do. That's true today in Scandinavian countries and others uh, that invest in equity and education access. Uh, the third is the conditions of work, and this is a pretty big pot of things. Of course, it has to do with exposures at work, the safety of the workplace. It also has to do with meaning in work, and there's really interesting research that shows that people who feel attached to their work and involved in it actually have better life expectancies than people who are alienated at their workplace. That has to do with the conditions of work, the social conditions, but it also has to do with, in with income. We t often talk about uh, in, you know, a fair income or a minimum income or a minimum, a minimum wage. Uh, in, the, in the epidemiologic community, the terms used, supplied, for example, here by Professor Jerry Morris, is a minimum income for healthy living. And that's larger, it's a higher level than our current policy approach to minimum wage, uh, or to the poverty limit, by the way. Uh, the definition of a minimum income for healthy living would, would, would calculate an income sufficient to achieve food and shelter and also to live a life of dignity and development. That's a higher number than we aim for by policy in any part of this country. The fourth is an interesting area. It has to do with how we deal with the aged, uh, a topic of increasing interest to me as I age. Uh, it, it's, it's kind of weird, but countries that have effective policies for dealing with aging, assuring food security, connectivity, housing for the aged, actually have higher health status in the population as a whole. I don't actually understand why that's the case, but it's an independent determinant of the social status of a country, the way it deals with its aged. It's reflected for the aged in isolation. For example, loneliness is a killer, and it especially afflicts, pe afflicts people of, of, um, of uh, 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 more aged people. This shows, look at the risk ratio differences here for social integration as a determinant of longevity, um, you can um, you can see it in in, in statistic in statistical predictions of uh, coronary heart disease or stroke. People who report loneliness as a feature of their existence have a 29 percent higher chance of coronary heart disease. They have a 32 percent higher rate of stroke. Let me point out there are no drugs or medicines that I know of that produce a reduction of coronary heart disease risk by 29 percent or anything even close to it and stroke risk by 32%. These are massive effects of a condition called loneliness on risk, and it selectively affects the poor, although not uh, it's the elderly, and not only the elderly. It's a kind of weird thing, by the way, I'll just point out that we are in a country where an elder can count on a prescription for a $50,000 drug. It's their, it's their right, but they can't count on food tomorrow. We just have a, a policy that's aimed at the care, not at the prevention of the need for the care. Uh, the fifth factor is a, is a potpourri. It's resilience of community. It's probably what you would think of if I asked you what social determinants are. This has to do with the conditions in your neighborhood. Your, uh, my colleagues here are going to be talking about some of those. Transportation, food security, housing security, violence in the streets, structural racism. These are properties of communities and resilient communities that work on these properties with adequate housing, adequate food, really work hard on racism and, and its, its, its end. Are, are going to be healthier communities at large. This is shown in a very interesting study uh, by uh, Lalonde and colleagues in Canada. You're looking here at the probability of suicide uh, attempts in native communities, indigenous communities in Canada. Communities that feel empowered, that have structures, have far lower rates of suicide than communities that do not. We could show that in the US as well. Uh, this is where uh, deaths of despair also count. Uh, Nancy mentioned this, as you probably know, uh, last year, I believe it was last year, was the first year in, in, in our records in which the life expectancy for an adult in middle years fell instead of rose in this country. All of that change is attributable to the deaths that Angus Deaton, the Nobel Nobelist uh, economist, and Anne Case have written up as deaths of despair. And as Nancy said, that's deaths from alcohol alcoholism, suicide, and substance abuse. That's what's eating into life expectancy for people in their middle ages in this country, and they are social determined, socially determined. The last of um, Marmot's categories is the biggest. He calls it fairness. Uh, it's hard to talk in this country about conditions of communities that are very conventionally talked about in other countries, conditions like solidarity and, and wealth redistribution. I, I, no matter what party you're in or whatever, where you sit politically, I can tell you the facts. The facts are that societies and communities that attend to fairness, attend to social justice, 
that, that are unembarrassed about redistrib redistribution at, at fair levels are healthier and they live longer. The, 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 the line that Marmot returns to over and over again is that inequalities in power, money, and resources give rise to inequities in the conditions of daily life, which lead to inequities in health. In essence, he's arguing fairness is actually a determinant of the, so, of the other five social conditions. And uh, to be honest about where we are in the United States right now, wealth inequalities are growing, income inequalities are growing, people of low and moderate income are losing out compared to people of higher income, and that's the wrong direction if what you care about is health and wellness in societies. Now, can we do anything about it? Absolutely, yes. The scientific foundations for intervention would take another 20 minutes, which I don't have, to even begin to touch on. Uh, but we're seeing some really good examples. Now, if you, if you will think globally, and I urge you to, if you're willing to drop the idea of American exceptionalism in solving this and look around the world for countries and societies that are dealing with, you will find wonderful examples. And I travel all over the world and see them. And I'm not embarrassed to say we have a lot to learn from other countries. But looking within this country, we're seeing some really good stuff emerge. One of the really interesting stories, for example, is what's going on at Rush University Medical Center, which is leading a project in the Chicago area to reduce that subway map difference between the Loop and West Chicago. They're doing it with a consortium of other organizations, but they're, they're using it, they're using the approach now called the Anchor Mission or the Anchor Community Approach. And I don't know the number now, it's several, it's several dozen communities in, this uh, communities in this country have an anchor institution. It's a very simple idea and I'd say very American idea. Healthcare is a big purchaser, a big user of American resources, 18% of GDP. That 18% is being spent on jobs and buildings and innovations and developments. And all anchor institutions are doing is taking the seven, their portion of the $782 billion that healthcare expends on employment and construction and just maintaining the hospital and spending it locally. And with no, no, it doesn't cost any more money. You're just focusing your economic impact on, on your neighborhood. Uh, and on the subway map. Rush University Medical Center has written the Anchor Mission Playbook. I, I, please get it. Please look at it. It's brilliant. It's a story about how an organization can take what it's normal business and begin to use it as a lever for improving the conditions of the, of the areas it lives in. It's a remarkable story. The website is the Democracy Collaborative, it's called. That's the sponsoring organization. Or I'm sure if you email Rush uh, Medical Center, Dr. David Ansel there, he'll be happy to talk to you about it. It's one example, uh, not the only one by any means. Here's another example. This is an entrepreneurial philanthropist in Georgia, began a project uh, which is called Purpose Built Communities. This is not healthcare led. Healthcare organizations and some of them participate. I believe there's about I, th I, want, I want to say the number is about 20 purpose-built communities. It's a mobilization of the entire community on social determinants. It's, I, I don't know another way to say what they're doing. With very specific targets, targets on crime, on welfare dependency, on unemployment, and on graduation rates. In East Lake, Georgia, which was a terribly afflicted sm small community in, in, in Georgia, the purpose-built community results are shown here. They reduced in it's less than five years, I believe, a 90% reduction in violent crime. Welfare dependence went from 59% to 5%. Unemployment of non-disabled, non-elderly, that, that, uh, that is now zero. And high school graduation rates, actually the graduation rates are up, they're now up uh, over, over 80%. They're now, I think, 94% was the last number I saw. Dramatic results by mobilizing the economic forces in the community to take social determinants seriously. It could be done. Uh, this is not done to communities, by the way. It's done with communities. And the idea that healthcare will show up on a white, uh, as a white knight on a horse to rescue the community, that's not the right way to think about it. We're talking about partnering, and I'm sure you're going to hear that from my colleagues. Uh, a good example of that is what's going on with, with uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center, which has decided to invest its energies in getting the backs of 60,000 children in, in Cincinnati, children of low income, and changing their health status. But they're not telling people what to do. They're not even... They're not even, I don't even think they say leading it. What they're doing is setting the table, and I've been there several times now, where all the community activists who want to get together and finally work together, get some sponsorship and support from the hospital to begin to get to work on the well-being of 60,000 children. Michael Marmot believes, and I believe, that a lot of what we call social determinants of health will depend on national policies, which need to be compassionate, uh, oriented around causes, and redistributional. But he also emphasizes, as I strongly believe, communities can take responsibility. You see that happen at Rush Medical Center in Chicago. You see it happen in, in purpose-built communities. You can see it happen in every community in this country. At the policy level, though, I think we need to look one other problem in the face, and that is where do the resources come from? 
And here we have not a very good picture in this country. Uh, we are underinvested in dealing with the social determinants. Now, here are the numbers. In the most OECD countries, most wealthy countries in, in the Western world, uh, study by Betsy Bradley, who, who currently president of Vassar, but before that a researcher at Yale, Betsy published a landmark article which asked the question, how much do nations put into social determinants, how much do they put into health care? And the ratio in almost every Western democracy is two to one. Two dollars on social determinants for one dollar spent on health care. The United States is 90 cents to one. We are spending less than half of what other countries do on dealing with this. As a result, we are paying a very high price. And I firmly believe that one of the, one of the only powerful tools we have to get American health care costs under control is to find a way to either allocate or reallocate resources so we're working on true causes. Health care is a repair shop. It's fixing bent fenders and dents. How about working on the roads and the safety? And that would be moving upstream and would be smart. Uh, we could do it. We just have to decide to do it. Thank you very much.